and let's just invite the Lord to come and be with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to meet together. We thank you that you're here, Lord. We thank you that you send your spirit uh, to lead us and guide us. And tonight, I pray that you would, again, just transform our minds. We thank you for the gift of learning. What an incredible gift it is. We thank you tonight that um, you call those who come after you, and Scripture calls those who come after you disciples, which means learners. We thank you for opportunity to learn more. I pray, God, that as we learn more, we would view it not as an opportunity to promote ourselves, but to worship you and to promote your name. We thank you for the gift of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that heaven is going to be a time when, not when we finally have arrived, but when we realize how much learning is left to do. And we thank you, Lord, that we are those who are created and you are the creator. So may we ever be um, open to learning more about you. We love you. Bless Nick tonight. Help him. Give him strength. And uh, we thank you for this time together. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Nick's here. Nick, come on up, brother. Uh, I'm Nick. And apparently I learned tonight that because I'm over six feet tall, I'm aggressive and mean and domineering. I don't know why I came to church tonight. I've been nothing but insults and since I walked in the door. <laughs> That's okay. I walked, down, I walked down to dinner and the first person to speak to me was Kurt. And he looked at me and goes, you're an intellectual? <laughs> well... I thought I was, but I'm suddenly second guessing myself and everything I thought. Uh, can we can we worship together for a minute? Uh, by the way, I'm just going to let you know up front. It really annoys me when I hear people say things like, "We're going to worship at our church," and then there's a sermon. Uh, because what I want to say is. We sing at our church and then we worship. Uh, the, the sermon is more a moment of, of worship for me than it is when we sing. So let's just break ourselves of that vocabulary of calling singing only worship uh, because worship is so much more than that. Uh, let's pray and then I'm going to do something different. Father God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for this time and this place and this opportunity and this privilege. It is humbling to be in this space. Uh, it's humbling to stand in front of these people uh, and at the moment I feel a bit on the vulnerable side the more I think about it and the time that's ahead of us. So just be with us, and I pray that you would be at the center of tonight, uh, that our minds would be turned to you, uh, Lord Jesus. Be with us now, and we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I picked this up, uh, this little book, at a conference I was at recently, and uh, this hits a couple of different worship nerves for me in my mind, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But first, this is called To Pray to Speak uh, by Lo Alleman. I'm not going to do this justice. He's got a rhythm and a cadence in his voice that I can't touch. Uh, so... Closed eyes ain't always the blindest. Nice words ain't always the kindest. Moses had to challenge Pharaoh. Christ had words with Pilate. Protests need no volume unless the problem is the silence. If sin still lynches those before us, then these issues can't be behind us. 
There's a brief union between hammer and nail. Any longer condescends the effort. Is the need for awakening not an urgent build? Do we not thirst for springs in the desert? Perhaps the church forgot that peace is a tool. What is complacency but hoarded comfort? Have we held our voices unmercifully long? Will we quench the spirit any longer? Does the loss of God's children not ache us? Is it time we cry for the Father? And then also, this may be more familiar to some than others. This is the Nicene Creed. We've been talking about the Apostles' Creed, uh, but this is the Nicene Creed, uh, which actually in reality has a much longer name. Uh, and this is the true ecumenical, completely ecumenical uh, creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Do you not just feel the excitement? Just something wells up in us, in our minds, uh, when our minds and our hearts come together. So tonight, uh, I am an intellectual worshiper. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, uh, what it is to be me. John and I were talking for a little bit after he talked about asceticism a couple of weeks ago and uh, this is a point that feels really vulnerable uh, because if you don't know me you, you don't know i live in my head one of my favorite and most terrifying movies to me is the movie mr holmes uh, which is the story of an aged sherlock holmes uh, who is his mind is going uh, and it's terrifying to me because my entire life is right here. Uh, this can give out, but this giving out is just horrifying to me. Uh, and so tonight I get to lay bare uh, who, who I am and what lives up here and try and make it make sense in some way. Uh, but something John did that uh, I want to do as well is to take a look at Mark uh, chapter 12, verse 29 to th through 30. This is actually Jesus speaking the Shema, uh, which is a Hebrew word that means listen. Um, and practicing, uh, practicing Jewish people, Hebrews, uh, pray the Shema twice a day. They pray it in the morning and as they go to sleep at night. It says, Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, Israel, Shema Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Tonight, we key in on the mind uh, a little further. 
to me, some of this stuff is easy. It's easy to, to love God with your heart. It's a little harder with the mind. Um, because I think culturally, we just don't think that they go together. Uh, they don't, you can't be intellectual and worship. Uh, we've seen too much abuse in the academic and intellectual realms. But I don't believe that's true because we're invited by Jesus himself to worship with all our mind. Uh, it's at the heart of the call. I also say this tempered. Uh, you're going to find out here in a minute. I am very lopsided to, to the intellectual end of worship. Uh, incredibly lopsided to that. Uh, but I, at times, I, I have to be an activist, even though that, was, that is my lowest scoring point uh, by a lot. Enthusiast, I have to show up and I have to sing with my brothers and sisters uh, because I'm called to obedience. Uh, then Samuel said, this is, this is Samuel's rebuke of Saul. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, Saul becomes king and then very quickly messes it all up. And God says, I will rip the kingdom out of your hands because of your lack of obedience. And Samuel says this because Sa Saul says, I'm obedient. I did what I was supposed to do. And Saul says, no, or Samuel says, no, Saul, you didn't. You didn't do what you were told. And Samuel says this, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he does in obedience? Certainly, obedience is better than sacrifice. Paid attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and presumption is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the Lord's orders, he has rejected you from being king. Again, even though I live out of my head, there is this call of obedience to God that says, I'm going to show up with my brothers and sisters. I'm going to show up alongside the enthusiast. I'm going to show up alongside the traditionalist. I'm going to show up alongside the activist. And I'm going to be there with them and I'm going to share in the kingdom with them because it's not just about me. It's about living in the midst of the kingdom and being a part of the body. And so I must be obedient to that call in the midst of who I am. Okay, here we go. So this is who I am. Uh, I am a ascetic intellectual naturalist. Uh, when I take the quizzes uh, for this, uh, when I took the one out of the book, Aesthetic, it, it scores out of 30 on each one, by the way. Uh, I scored 30 for aesthetic. I scored 29 for intellectual. And I scored 24 for naturalist. Then nothing else broke 20. Uh, activist, I scored two. Enthusiast, I scored eight. Uh, traditionalist got me to a 15. Um, so I very much am up here uh, in my head. So what that means is generally I want to look at you and say, leave me alone and let me think. Okay, you've got a question for me. You've got a problem. You've got something you want to dump on me. Don't push me for an answer right then. Let me sit down. Let me think. I had a church offer me a job one time just to be a part time pastor. They're like, we just want you to be in office like six hours a week and preach on Sunday mornings. And we'll pay you twice what you're being paid right now. Uh, and I said, let me think. It took me two weeks to give them an answer. I said, no. Uh, so that's my natural reaction is, leave me alone and let me think for a bit. Let me sit in my chair and wrestle through it. Uh, home in my chair, in my recliner, reading, or at my desk, are really two of my favorite places in the world to be. Uh, those are the two places I commune with God the most. 
uh, really today, as I was kind of finalizing my thoughts and putting these slides together, I think I sat at my desk for four hours and it was amazing. Uh, all the kids that live in my neighborhood were at school and so there was no noise. I didn't have radio playing. It was just me and a Bible and my computer and a pencil and a notebook and my thoughts and just living in the presence of the world that God had called me to. And I loved it. Loved it. Uh, most people would go, they'd have to go turn Fox News on in the background. Um, not me. My happiest, most connected moments with God look like this. Alone, thinking about an idea in a canoe on the river or a lake, uh, whichever seems to be most available at that time. I actually park my car in the driveway so that my canoes can be in the house. Uh, so those are my happiest places, my happiest moments. The number of miles that I have done on White River, the number of miles I've done paddling around Lake Monroe and Patoka Lake. Uh, and I have had some incredible moments with Jesus early in the morning, just out floating, thinking, uh, I won't tell you the story, but one time I found myself in a live action Disney movie out on Lake Monroe. Eagles were flying, deer were walking along the lake. It was incredible. Uh, and then we come to the worship wars. <laughs> Every time I sit in the back pew of the balcony where there aren't other people, and I hear people start arguing about how there should be more organ and less drums, or some people saying there should be more drums and guitar. I'm sitting back there listening to you all going, hey, I've got a cure. Let's get rid of it all because I don't want to hear it anyway. <laughs> let's, let's read scripture and sit in silence and then have like a solid 40 minute sermon like that's exegetical sermon. It's like a dream come true for me. But again, when I walk in on Sunday, it's not about me. It's about the body. And there are some of you that need to sing and want to sing. And so I am more than happy to jump in and sing along beside you. Uh, the songs mean something different for me. Uh, and I interact with them a little differently. So I want to show you my two uh, places where I meet with Jesus. John showed you pictures of the desert. I don't know what Tim Thompson showed you. Uh, I could only guess. But this, this is, this is hard for me to show you. I've been thinking about it all day. I mean, if you ever come to my house, I mean, you're going to see these things anyway, but it feels like I'm just laying myself open for you. So this is the place where I meet with Jesus first and foremost every day. Uh, that's my recliner. Uh, my recliners, oddly enough, have become legendary over the years. Like when I used to do student leader meetings at my house, like if I walked out of the room for a minute, I'd come back in and like kids, like three of them would be sitting in my recliners because they would fit. And they'd be like, oh, you're so big. <laughs> yeah, now get out of my chair. <laughs> uh, I, can you see the little red arrow? That's pointing at a book. I just want to tell you, this is, this is a little important later on, but uh, that little gray, that not little gray book um, is 500 pages on temple and the theology of temple in the Bible. I have that book because I looked at the president of Asbury Seminary and said, I love your catechism, but you messed up on temple. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't take it far enough. And Adam stood in the corner and he laughed when I did it. Uh, and so then Dr. Tennant looked at me and said, I've got a book you need to read. <laughs> 
uh, and I ended up with that. So this is my other favorite place to be. This is where I spent hours today. Uh, and I actually may like this space more than I like my recliner because this is the space where I really start to dig in. Uh, this is a space where uh, I make notes and I wrestle through commentaries and really think about the, the world that I live in. Uh, and I just really like this space. And then it's also attached. I mean, you can see the stickers on it. Like it's all these places I have been and things that I enjoy and uh, memorabilia of students and, and things that we've done. Uh, and just so you don't judge me, see that little arrow in case you could see the little idol sitting in the corner. Um, I wanted you to know that wasn't an idol that I was trying to hide. That's just a pic That's just a little statue of Socrates I picked up in Greece this summer. Uh, he's kind of one of my intellectual heroes. So just in case anybody saw it, I didn't want you calling me going, hmm, uh, somebody's not read the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so a lot of times people end with the dangers. I want to get the dangers out of the way. So the mind is a dangerous place, can be. Uh, Jesus said this when he was talking to teachers of the law and the Pharisees. You study the scriptures thoroughly because you think in them you possess eternal life. And it is these same scriptures that testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. It is really easy when you live in your head, when you worship as an intellectual, uh, that it never gets past your head that it never moves from this space to this space. Uh, and it's important that the connection is there. It's important that there's a free flow back and forth between the head and the heart and the soul and the spirit. Uh, and so verses like this are challenging um, for intellectuals. Are we, are we just living in our head? Or are we really engaging with the one who gave us the scriptures that we study so diligently? So these are some of the dangers of being among the intellectuals. Uh, one is the way you dress. No. Uh, seeking controversy. Uh, I've, I've got several. This, I generally, I listed these, by the way, in the order of the least struggle for me to the most, the biggest struggles for me. Uh, again, a very vulnerable moment. Um, despite the fact that I looked at Tim Tennant and said, you're wrong, uh, I really don't like controversy. Um, it's not something I seek out. I try and avoid it as much as possible. But there are a lot of in intellectuals who this is, I mean, they can go here so fast, so easy. They are ready to correct everybody on everything that they think they're wrong about. Uh, and they will jump on you. If you have anything that even whispers of sounding like heresy, and it's really not helpful, and it's not kingdom building, and it's not uplifting in any way. These gifts and these pathways should be uplifting to the body. Uh, Timothy, it would seem, was probably an intellectual uh, because Paul had to write him and remind him but reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind toward all, an apt teacher, patient, correcting uh, opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and then knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they are held captive to do his will. So don't go seeking controversy. Don't go be one of the talking heads that yells back and forth at each other. You know, uh, I just lost the name of the author of the book. Uh, Gary, what's his last name? Thomas. 
Yeah, Gary Thomas tells a story of, you know, the comic that went around of, I'll, I'll be to bed in a minute. Somebody said something wrong on the internet. Don't, don't be that guy. It's going to ruin your own life and you're not helping anybody. Uh, the next one is this, knowing but not doing. Uh, it's really easy. I, like, like I started off saying, I would much rather be at home in my recliner reading N.T. Wright uh, than really being anywhere else. Uh, I would rather be at home alone uh, than, than out and among people. I have days, I don't know if this is, this may, you may think I'm a terrible person after this, I don't know. I pretty much wake up at seven o'clock every morning and I may not talk to another, on an average day, I'm not sure I talk to another human until at least noon. Uh, it's just the world. And sometimes I, during COVID early on, uh, I went to the post office one day and started talking to somebody and spoke for thir about 30 seconds and my voice started to crack. And it hit me that I had not spoken to another human being out loud in somewhere like three or four days. Uh, and I loved it. <laughs> so it's really easy to know and not do. Um, Jerry Seinfeld has a big shtick about, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world to do nothing. Uh, it really is. And Jesus warns us again, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the experts in the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, pay attention to what they tell you and do it. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads, hard to carry, and put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing even to lift a finger to move them. So again, the call of obedience for intellectuals is that we can't just live on our head. We have to get out and the things that we think and the things that we wrestle with, we have to get out and do something with it. We can't just dump it on people and then leave it and walk away and not talk to anybody for four days. We have to get out. The next one is one that I struggle with. Uh, I hope it's hard to tell, but, but, but maybe not. Uh, arrogance. It's so easy. Pride. Uh, when you live in your head and you spend all day thinking and you think through things a lot and over and over and over again, it's really easy uh, to get annoyed with people when they tell you you're wrong or when they challenge things that you've spent days months, years thinking about, and you just want to look down your nose at them and go, you don't, don't even, you're not on my level. Uh, it's really easy to do that. But again, Jesus warns us. Jesus also told this parable to some who were confident that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, extortionists, unrighteous people, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. The tax collector, however, stood far off and would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, sinner that I am. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so there's this call to humility that Saul missed that we talked about earlier. There's this call to, to lift each other up, to lift people up, and help them be learners and to not look down at people because they don't see the world the way that I do 
and it's not always the easiest thing in the world. Uh, and I talk to Jesus about this a lot, uh, that I would stay humble. And some days I'm better at that than others. Uh, hopefully more often than not, but. Uh, the next one is probably my biggest struggle. Um, it really is. I mean, I've already mentioned it a few times. Uh, for intellectuals, we can isolate. Uh, it's just the nature of who we are. We want to be, at least for me, I want to be with my books. Uh, I want to be with the great minds. Uh, and I want to sit in my recliner or I want to sit at my desk, uh, or I want to go walk by myself with something that I need to wrestle with, some thought that I have, some theological internal debate that's going on, or some new thought that just blows me away. And so I want to isolate. But again, the writer of Hebrews gives this warning. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. And so there is this call to not isolate. Okay, now let's deal with the fun stuff. Uh, again, I ordered this, the, the parts of the intellectual worshiper that are fun, the parts that are, are good to deal with, uh, where you might find, you know, yourself connecting in the intellectual vein. I put these in order from least interesting to me to the ones that grab at my heartstrings the most. Uh, and this first one may surprise you a little bit, at least some of you who know me. Uh, apologetics, defending the faith. Uh, each of these, I give you some resources, some things that you can look at. Apologetics is this whole idea of argument. And uh, for, for people who struggle with uh, confrontation, and seeking controversy, this, this may be kind of in their natural bent. Um, but it's this idea of, here's God, and I'm going to give you a reasoned argument as to why you can think about and should think about and believe in God. Uh, there are some brilliant apologists. One of the greats, of course, is right there in the middle, C.S. Lewis. Uh, we all know who C.S. Lewis is. If you don't, talk to me afterwards. Uh, I'll clue you, clue you in on where to start. Um, this one just really does not resonate with me. Uh, for, for whatever reason, I've had this long-standing sense of, like, God is big enough, he doesn't need me to fight for him. Uh, most of the time, I need him to fight for me. So, uh, but for some people, this is, this is their thing. I've had some friends over the years where this is where they connect with Jesus. Um, is, is that reasoned argument for what they believe and why they believe it. We're getting closer for me, but there's systematic theology, the study of doctrine. You know you have grabbed a book by an intellectual because you're going to be asleep before you finish the title. Uh, Concise Theology by J.I. Packer, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, R.C. Sproul, and just so we could get a Wesleyan good thinker in here, uh, a plain account of Christian perfection. Again, this is the idea of worshiping through understanding what the church believes, uh, the church's beliefs, what we think about baptism, what we think about God, what we think about uh, the book of Revelation, apocalyptic literature, what we think about all of these things, our systematic theology, and where, how we come to those decisions of what we believe as a church or as a people. For some people, that's their vein. I mean, I had friends when I was at Indiana Wesleyan who just like lived for theology classes. Uh, I did everything I could to try and figure out how to get out of my theology one class. 
Um, but this is it for some people. This may be it for some of you. Like just thinking through what the church thinks and how it believes and why it believes the way that it does. This one's a little closer to my heart, the creeds. The things we agree on. The things that are true across the body of believers. Systematic theology will dig into the things that separate us and the things that, that come together and unify us as a collective, holy, Catholic, apostolic church. But the creeds, people who dig into the creeds, they're looking for the things that unite us, those commonalities. Dorothy Sayers said it is worse than useless for Christians to talk about the importance of Christian morality unless they are prepared to take their stand on the fundamentals of Christian theology. Unless you are willing to get down to the grassroots, the structure, the, the skeleton of what we believe, what does it matter? I love the creeds. I love reading through the creeds. I love the rhythms of the creeds. Uh, I, have, I have loved walking through the Apostles' Creed uh, and wrestling through that. I'm actually doing that with my student leaders. And in two weeks, at the crowd, the ministry that I run. We got a bunch of kids who don't know Jesus. They've never encountered Jesus in any way. We're gonna go through the Apostles' Creed over the course of the rest of this year, and they're not gonna know. It's gonna be great, unless they watch this video, and then they're gonna be clued in. Uh, so it's gonna be so much fun because things are gonna start to connect for them. And so the intellectual creed person worships through the ecumenical statements of the church. Ecumenical is a $10 word for the common things, the common things with the church. We're getting close. Church history, the study of where we come from. Uh, you got a couple of books there. I've not read either of them. You have to apologize. I have to apologize, but these were recommended by uh, somebody else. Uh, I have actually spent a great deal in recent days reading about the history of the 24-7 prayer movement and the Moravians uh, who came across the Alps in the 1700s uh, to escape persecution, violent persecution in Prussia, uh, and set up in a little town, a little village in Hernhut, Germany, uh, under the auspices of, the auspices of Count Zinzendorf. Um, and it's funny because Count Zinzendorf and John Wesley knew each other uh, and they couldn't stand each other. They both thought the other one was arrogant. Uh, but John Wesley was deeply moved by the Moravians who lived around uh, Zinzendorf's estate. And they launched a prayer movement that lasted went 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a hundred years. Um, it was just mind blowing to me. And it was that John Wesley came and encountered that and then went back to Aldersgate in England and said, oh, there's a strange warming of my heart. Uh, as Pete Gregg, the, the biggest understatement of the century. Um, but some people really dig this church history stuff. Like it's their thing. I have volumes on my shelves. Well, I have volumes in boxes right now. Uh, I moved out of my house back in April uh, and I've been living in a borrowed house. Uh, and so all of my books are in boxes and it makes me very sad. Uh, if you know anybody who has one to 10 acres for sale, I'd like to chat with them. Uh, but I have volumes that are just on church history. And then this is one of my favorites. There's one more after this, but ethics. When I was at Indiana Wesleyan, Christian ethics was my jam. Steve Horst taught ethics when I was there. Uh, and I adored that class. I actually, in those boxes, I still have my ethics textbook um, from when I was at Indiana Wesleyan. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, one of the great ethicists uh, of the 20th century. 
but this is just the idea of the study of decision making, how we think about controversial issues. I love to sit in this place and just wrestle with Scripture and what God says about the hard decisions uh, that our world faces. When we walked into COVID a few years ago, there was a big question of what is the Christian response to all of this? How do we treat each other? How do we behave? Do we vax? Do we not vax? Do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? And I'll be most honest, that was not bothersome to me. Uh, it was, I liked sitting in that place and wrestling with those things, with the Black Lives Matter movement and all the things that are attached to that, the protests and, and all of that. I love to sit and wrestle through that. When those hot button, button issues come up, I enjoy wrestling and talking to God about those things. And what is our response? What is the Christ-like response in this? And there's a rich history in the Christian church of ethicists, uh, people wrestling with ethics. The, I've never been able to find it, but the Jesuits in the Catholic church have this rich history of how they lead the Catholic church in decision-making, and it's beautiful. Uh, and they wrestle with the deep issues of humanity and life. Uh, and that's their place of worship. And I love sitting in that place. I love taking long walks with an issue. In fact, some of the decisions I made on how I was going to do ministry during the shutdown, uh, the COVID shutdown, came while I was out on bike rides by myself thinking about the kids that I serve and the ministry that I do and what that looks like when you can't be together. And I came alive in those moments. So I'm sorry for those of you that it was really hard. Uh, and then this one, this is really my heartbeat. If ethics is my breathing, this is my heartbeat. Biblical study. A uh, couple of great books, uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee, and I just lost his first name, so Fee and Stewart. Uh, then also The Bible Project, tons of videos, tons of blog posts. Tim Mackey uh, is, and Carissa Quinn and John Collins and their whole staff are some of the most articulate uh, in biblical thought right now, uh, and I love, <laughs> I, I took yesterday off, um, we had fall break last week, so I spent 24-7 24, 24 with a bunch of teenagers, 20 teenagers last week, uh, in one cabin in Gatlinburg, <laughs> and so I needed the day off, and so I just pushed play on the podcast, and I just listened to Tim Mackey for three hours, uh, as I drove around yesterday, and it was wonderful. Uh, and then a set of commentaries. Sometimes you look at the commentaries that sit on a pastor's shelf, and it's just overwhelming to look at them. Uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, and some other people got together, and they created a commentary set, the Bible for everyone, and it's incredibly accessible. Um, so if you want to go deep, but looking at you know, some of the commentaries that sit on our shelves just makes you take a step back. Look at the Bible for Everyone uh, by N.T. Wright. Great stuff. Uh, and so I worship through growing understanding of Scripture. Like I have, uh, I hope Tim Thompson watches this. Tim, I'm going to look right at the camera and say this. I've spent the last year in Torah. <laughs> Uh, the first five books of the Bible, and it's been incredible. Uh, Tim once told our staff that if I said Torah one more time, he was going to dump coffee in my lap. Uh, but I have loved it, and it's been so rich. By the way, just so you know, there's no animosity between Tim and I. He's one of my closest friends. I adore him. Uh, but this is, this is it for me. 
I could sit all day and think about Scripture and wrestle through Scripture. And so that's what I want to do. I want to close out in these last 15 minutes uh, with some more worship. Can we do that? Are you okay with that? Are you awake? Has the intellectual put you to sleep yet? That's one of the other struggles of intellectuals is we can put everybody in a room asleep like that. Uh, it goes so fast. Uh, we start to nerd out and whew, then it's over. So can we worship a bit more? Do you mind? This is, this is my kind of worship. Uh, we're not going to sing, sorry. Uh, so I want to give you some background. Uh, so a, a few years ago, this is something I've been through, and I've had new revelations on this as I've wrestled with it recently. Uh, but a, a couple of years ago, I was reading through the Gospel of John uh, and making lots of notes on the Gospel of John. And at the same time, I was reading a book called Broken Signpost by N.T. Wright. And Tom made a statement in that book that triggered a thought in my head. And so I started flipping. It's just like, okay. And so I did the only thing I could think of doing right then. I emailed N.T. Wright uh, and said, okay, what do you think about this? Am I over-interpreting here? Uh, or uh, am I taking, am I, am I going the wrong direction with this? Uh, and Dr. Wright answered me. Um, and he said, no, I think you're, I think you're spot on. Uh, I, he said, in, in fact, most, in most cases, I think we under-interpret the Gospel of John versus over-interpret the Gospel of John. Uh, and then he signed it, uh, something like, sincerely, Tom Wright. So I felt like at that point I had permission to refer to him as Tom Wright from that day forward. Uh, so he's no longer N.T. Wright to me. He is now Tom Wright. Uh, we're old buddies uh, because we've exchanged, like, two emails. So this is, this is what we, I want to do. So somebody look up uh, Genesis 3, 23 through 24. I can cheat because I already have it marked, but I would love to hear a voice other than mine tonight. So Genesis 3, 23 through 24. And these are snippets of a much larger story, a uh, much larger thing that is, that is happening. Anybody want to read that? Thanks, Bill. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. So something you need to know here is uh, at its root, this is actually plural or angelic beings placed at the garden with a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to keep humanity out of the garden. Okay, background information. See, this is where I'm going to nerd out and you're all going to fall asleep on me. Okay, you may not have known this, but the Garden of Eden was the first temple. If you read the scripture closely, you find out that Adam and Eve were not made in the garden. Adam was formed outside the garden in the land of Eden. And then God brought him to the garden where he would walk with man. And he would come and join man and walk. It's the first, it's the first image of temple in Scripture. And it's the first image of a priest and a priestess of the Most High God coming in to have relationship with the creator of the universe. It's this incredible, beautiful image. And that's where it all starts. Is we mess it up and we're driven out of the garden and these cherubim, 
these angelic beings are placed on either side of the garden to keep us from going back in to the place of worship, to keep us from going back in to the temple and communing with God, to keep us not, not because God didn't want to have a relationship with us, but God's holiness is so great that it consumes that which is unrighteous. And so our brokenness meant that we couldn't fully walk into the presence of God anymore because our brokenness would be consumed. We see that happen throughout Scripture. Okay, here's the next one. Somebody look up Exodus 25, 17 through 22. Some of you are going to get this way faster than I got it. If somebody finds it, go ahead and just read it out. Did you see it? Did you see what happened there? There are two cherubim placed on the ark, built into the lid of the ark. Do you know what the name of the ark or the lid for the ark was? It's the mercy seat. It's where we, we have it right here. It's where the, the priest would come in to meet with God. They would come into the tabernacle they would come in to the place, the Holy of Holies, and in that place was the Ark of the Covenant that had two cherubim on it that separated the priest from the presence of God. So they wouldn't be consumed by the holiness of God. There were it's these angelic beings that show up Again, and here's the other thing you need to know, a little more background information. If you look through Exodus and you look through the way that this is written up and the description of the tabernacle that's being built, it's garden imagery. It's mind-blowing. Pomegranates, almond trees, it's there. And it's the place where man comes in to commune with God. And yet he's protected by two cherubim. Two angelic beings are set there to keep us safe from a holy God. Okay, we jump forward again. First Kings 8, 6 through 7. I'll read this one for you. I'll read these last two uh, because I'm just getting too excited and I can't wait anymore. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I'm going to get taken up. <laughs> the priest brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its assigned place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, in the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim's wings extended over the place where the ark set. The cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. So the temple has just been built. We're about to dedicate it. Solomon has done the work. The ark is in its place. And what's the image? By the way, the temple, again, you read the description that's laid out in Kings, and we find all of this garden imagery again. 
It's lined with cedar wood, and there are pomegranates of gold around the capitals of the columns and all this stuff. I mean, it's just garden imagery after garden imagery after garden imagery. And then we walk into the temple, we walk into the Holy of Holies, and what do we find? We find two angelic beings guarding the Holy of Holies, guarding the Ark of the Covenant, where man, humanity, the priest, will come in to have relationship with the creator of the universe. But the cherubim are there to protect us because our holiness, our brokenness, can't be in the presence of God because his holiness will consume us. One more jump. We jump up to John chapter 20. And I give you fair warning. You need to know this as I read. This takes place in a garden outside the city in the wilderness. Now, very early, there you go, so you can follow along if you want. John 20, 1 through 14. Now, very early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out to go to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the strips of linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who had been following him, arrived and went right into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been around Jesus' head, not lying with the strips of linen cloth, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, came in, and he saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Hang on, it's about to get real good. So the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she bent down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to the woman, why are you weeping? Mary replied, they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. How beautiful is this? Like, do you see this? Do you see the wonder of the scripture here? Two angelic beings protecting the garden, but all of a sudden they're standing open and saying, God's not in the grave anymore. You can have relationship with the creator of the universe again. There doesn't have to be a barrier there anymore. It's this incredible, beautiful, amazing image of the work of God from the very beginning of history to the redemption that comes through Jesus. And it all came while I was sitting in my recliner, wrestling through and thinking about the scripture and struggling through Tom Wright's book. God is walking with us in the garden again. This is the fun of being an intellectual worshiper. 
is I get to make these connections and then give them to you and you get to go write a song about them that confuses the daylights out of me. <laughs> but I love it. And I love that God has, has made me this way. Uh, I, I want you to know I don't envy you. Those of you who, who are other things, I don't envy you, but man, I'm so glad that we get to share all of this together, that I get to see your enthusiasm. I get to see you go out and be an activist on behalf of your fellow humans. I'm so glad I get to do that. But I'm also glad that I get to sit in my recliner or at my desk and wrestle and think through these things and maybe point at them and have you pick them up and take them somewhere. Uh, before I pray, I, I guess I'll set this down and uh, play with a little Q&R. Um, I changed years ago. It was all about Q&A, but I don't really have many answers, uh, but I probably have responses. Uh, so uh, if you've got any questions, I would love to take a few minutes and try and answer or maybe point at an answer for you. So. If anybody's got any questions, you can be mean if you want. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somewhere in the studies I've done, it talks about they would tie a rope around the high priest as he mm -hmm. ran full of stuff and half and they could drag him out. Yeah. They couldn't go in there. Yeah. Uh, one, one day a year, uh, Yom Kippur, uh, the, the day of sacrifice of atonement, um, the high priest would take and offer a sacrifice on behalf of all of Israel um, into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle blood on the temple. There's some interesting things about that, though, because it wasn't about the, the sacrifice that went into the Holy of Holies wasn't about our sin. It was about cleansing the place where God dwelt. Um, which is a whole nother thing. Uh, and then the scapegoat that was part of that, where they would lay both hands on the goat and send it out into the de desert. That sacrifice that went out into the desert to wander alone, uh, that took our sins. That was part of the, the tradition um, and part of the law. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Anybody else? It's like, oh, please let him stop nerding. Nick, I understand why you Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, yeah, it, some of that is dependent on how, how you micro define apologetics. Um, so on a larger scale, they, they are very, they're closely related. Um, but when when I define the term apologetic myself, uh, I'm thinking specifically of the defense of faith and why you should believe it. Uh, the, the, reason for, the reason for faith. Um, I don't necessarily think of ethics in that same vein based on that definition. Yeah. Well, I think all, all six of these veins, sub-veins of the intellectual, are all closely tied. Um, it's just a matter of some of them grab closer to my heart than others do. 
I mean, I still find apologetics interesting. I, mere Christianity may save for the Bible, may be the book I've read the most in my life. Uh, but I don't, again, it's, it's based on how I define apologetics, um, which go back to the little guy that sits on my desk. Uh, you have to define your terms before you start arguing. Uh, to eliminate confusion. So based on how I define apologetics, I don't necessarily see them as one and the same, but I can understand how you might. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Yeah. I think heaven is Sabbath. Uh, so if we go all the way back to the beginning of the story, um, God makes, spends six days in creation. The last part of creation is humanity. And then he rests. So he's like, I've got a job for you, but now we're going to rest. And what's interesting is when we look at, when we look at, the, the scriptures in, uh, in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, it says there was evening and there was morning, which is its own thing uh, by itself, but there's evening and there's morning until we get to day seven. And then the rest of Sabbath never ends. It never says, and there was evening and there was morning. It was just this perpetuation. We were from the beginning of humanity invited into the rest of God. Uh, which is what sleep is, because when we're, sleep, when we're asleep, we're totally vulnerable. We must completely and wholly trust in God in that moment, because you can't defend yourself. You can't, I mean, you're just there. Uh, and so, and heaven's an interesting word for me to even use, but we won't go there. Uh, but it is ultimately, I mean, that is what God has ultimately invited us into, uh, the hope of resurrection is a hope of rest, um, a hope of eternal Sabbath. Um, and Sabbath wasn't necessarily just sitting in a chair doing nothing, although that sounds really good. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Any other? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I can say this in a sanctuary. I'm going to anyway. Uh, I tell teenagers this all the time when they say, I don't have time to read. I'm like, you go to the bathroom, right? It's amazing how fast you can go get through a book when you go to the bathroom. It's amazing how much thinking you can get done. You just go to the bathroom. I mean, uh, most of us bathe. I mean, that's a solid 15 minutes a day that you have where more than likely no one's with you. <laughs> uh, you may have small children. Um, and so it's just finding those snippets of time and then just learning to hold a thought in your head and just let it sit there and wrestle. I've had epiphanies and connections when I was driving down the road and something, or when I was working on something else. Background process, processing is real. It's something that really does happen inside of our brains. Um, and so we can pull up an idea. A Adam did this yesterday, he sent me an email yesterday morning, and I said, let me think about it while I'm driving around uh, today. And while I was driving and listening to a podcast, uh, it was just sitting back here in my brain. And over time, it m made its way forward. And all of a sudden I had something close to the words that I wanted to respond to his email. 
and then I responded this morning uh, because yesterday was my day off. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's just learning to grab a thought and hold on to it and then wherever you can find five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because I realize I lived a, for, for somebody who is wired like me, I live a really fortunate life that I live alone in a house with super thick walls uh, that are well insulated and mostly concrete and I can't hear anything. Um, so I'm, I understand that I'm blessed and fortunate in the midst of that. Uh, so any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So that shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, floating out in the ether is nickmullis.com. Um, so sometimes my words become, or my thoughts become words on a page that then go on the internet uh, for every, everybody to read, even though nobody reads them. I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, sometimes something will hit me and I just, I don't know what to do with it. This happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was with lunch with somebody and I was talking about this John thing that we just talked about and something else hit me. John reverses Genesis all the time. Uh, it's crazy. Ladies, John redeems you. Uh, you're the first. You get the tree of life first. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing and it hit me for the first time. I don't know how many times I've read it and I was like, I have to tell somebody. So I drove to the office. I was at lunch drove to the office, sat down, interrupted Caleb's class, and said, I have to tell you this. It was like, I needed somebody in the office that day. Um, sometimes it comes out in the crowd. I'll be reading something in preparation, and it's like, oh. Sometimes it comes out with my student leaders. You got to see that a lot when you're in high school. Um, so it comes out in a lot of different places. Uh, it comes out in conversations. The number of times I sat on Tim Thompson's couch and went, okay, <laughs> uh, this is in my head. Evelyn, the number of times I've stood out here in the narthex with, with Evelyn and went, okay, so this is what's going on. Sometimes I need to articulate it just so I can find the last threads and how they're going to go together. Um, so yeah, again, it's just kind of like when you need to find silence. It's, you just gotta, you've got to find a way. Um, write it down, just go drop in somebody's office and be like, I need you to listen to me for 30 seconds uh, and then I'm gonna go away, uh, whatever it is. Anybody else? Does that help at all? Okay. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Father God, thanks for today, thanks for this time. Thank you for this space. Thank you for the people in this room. Thank you for your word that is living and active. Thank you for the way that you move in our hearts and our spirits and our minds. Uh, Father God, be with us as we go from here that we would realize that you made us whole people. Uh, you made us complete people. And we recognize that in you. You made us a complete and whole body of believers in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with God. You've nerded enough. <laughs>